This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and this is Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm so glad you've joined us today. Today's episode is entitled Teaching Ethics to Counselors. We know that ethical behavior, the definition of ethical behavior in all fields is changing almost daily here. We have this whole new surge of people coming out um, and telling their stories. Shame has sort of been removed from the, the whole paradigm so that victims are able to come forward now. And that's really changing the whole picture of things and how we deal with these important issues of abuse, of power. I'm here today with Hal Stidger. Welcome, Hal. Thank you so much Peace for coming. Hal is um, a licensed marriage and family therapist who is an instructor of ethics at Chaminade University. And now with the way things are changing so rapidly, um, I'm, I'm so happy that you're here because I know I have a lot of questions on how this is all going to affect, you know, how we deal with these ethical, you know, situations and, mm -hmm. and issues and, and what kind of consequences maybe are going to change. And I think maybe the general public has a lot of questions about that, too. So I really... Not only that, but the right to know. Yeah. Yes, yes, we have the right to know. Absolutely. That is exactly right. Why don't you give us a little bit of a, I don't know, a small kind history of what, you know, okay, your well, background is? I'm always willing to talk about what I've done. Um, <laughs> I started my career about 35 years ago uh, uh, working in California in residential treatment with teenagers. Um, the uh, the field back in those days was uh, staffed mostly by bachelor's level uh, psych students and then supervised by graduate level students. Right. Um, the uh, uh, the time that I was in uh, San Diego was where I was in California. Um, the time I was there, I uh, worked at several different programs. Uh, I spent seven years at a program called Rancho Park Residential Treatment Center and hospital and it was a facility that dealt with uh, teenagers had about 60 teenagers that we took care of and I did that for seven years at the end of that time I was uh, promoted to administrative program director of that program wow. and uh, after a series of promotions but that's where I ended up and right about that time you know I, uh, administration is something I could do but it's not my love uh, treatment and hands-on uh, approaches with clients is my uh, real focus of what I like to do so uh, simultaneous to uh, being an administrator in that program, uh, I uh, started taking my graduate work towards becoming a marriage and family therapist. Nice. Three years later, uh, after a lot of night classes, I graduated, <laughs> and then over a period of two years, I interned with uh, four or five different places in San Diego, which qualified me then to sit for the license exam. Uh, passed the license exam, which then qualified me to sit for the oral exam. Wow, okay. And passed the oral examination, and then I became a licensed marriage and family therapist. Good job, okay. good job. And I'm sure you do a really great job at that, too. And now you are working at Chaminade University as an instructor for ethics, right? Uh -huh. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. That's what I'm really interested in. I'm, I'm in a private practice, so a, a lot of us in private practice do several things, right? So one of the things that I do is I'm an instructor at Chaminade. I'm an ethics professor. And so ethics is one of the first classes that graduate students take when they come in. Usually it's, it may be their first class even. And so uh, one of the things that I uh, find with a lot of students is they come in wondering, what is an ethics class? Is it going to be a philosophy class? Yeah, right. is it, you know, and, and so the very first night I, I straighten them out on that or I let them know, <laughs> inform them, it's, it's their right to know, um, that really what an ethics class is for counseling is a very practical or practical, applicable class in how to run a safe, effective uh, practice that's going to do the very best that you can for your clients. When you say safe practice, you mean for just the the 
clients or I mean I guess what I'm looking for too is the, how do you teach them how they're supposed to behave and what kind of consequences there are when they misbehave right <laughs> I think one absolutely and there are consequences very serious consequences malpractice censure loss of license I'll, I'll go into a little detail about that later but the first thing that we emphasize with our students and I think it's something that we emphasize throughout their entire graduate experience is self-awareness. Okay? Oh, People all come, students, counselors, all come to us with various levels of this is what my life experience is, this is what my cultural beliefs are, right. and, and without a keen sense of self-awareness, in other words, examining where you have developed your values right. and how they might um, either enhance or perhaps interfere with the counseling relationship. Right. Things like projecting your own values. There's a term called uh, uh, encapsulation. Okay, it's usually it's it's usually applied to cultural issues. Uh, if a, if a counselor is culturally encapsulated, it means that he's treating everyone that he sees, he or she is treating everyone that they see through their own cultural lens rather than the client's cultural lens, Oh right? gosh, and that can't be effective. No, it's not, it's a one-size-fits-all type yeah, of thing. Yeah. And that does never work because everyone is so different and, and culture plays such a big part in how people deal with these kind of traumatic issues. Absolutely, and especially here in Hawaii where we are so blessed to have so many cultures coming together. Right, right? exactly. Yeah, and the other thing about culture is is that, you know, I mean, so, so, a, so a counselor, uh, can't possibly know all things about all cultures, and even if they were to study in a book cultures, then you have individual differences within right. the culture, right? Sure. So the solution, just as a quick sideline here to that for counselors, is to work with the client and get them to inform you about right. what their culture is and what their needs are. And, and so I actually say to my clients, listen, as we're working, if you hear me proposing something that you're thinking to yourself, gosh, that doesn't fit my family, that doesn't fit who I am, right. then you have to let me know. And right. That's so you a good so, practice So the solution have. is to enlist your client as your informant right. about their culture. And certain cultures, even if you do that, they're still reticent to sure. to uh, you know to what uh, advise you on something. They they see you as a uh, you know a lot of ascribed status. They see you as the the leader, and they're hesitant to suggest things to you. So you have to kind of keep bringing it up. Right. Remember, sure. in fact, when you get a sense of that, I am perhaps crossing into some cultural thing that I don't understand. I'm seeing a little look on their face or something like that, or just because of the situation we're talking about, then I, I, it prompts me to bring, it prompts me and counselors in general to bring up that statement again. Remember, please inform me about right. anything I'm missing. Well, you know, the, what you say, it's interesting what you say about counselors having that power and, and clients thinking, well, they're the ones that have all the power. Mm -hmm. and, and that leads to abuse of power Absolutely. in some cases. Sure I mean, we sure know... Can. Well, not everybody knows, but most people know now about the um, Kamehameha Schools mm. problem with it's Dr. Horrible. Brown, who yeah. over a hundred people have come forward that he abused. Psychiatrist. And he was a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I guess what I really want to know is what kind of um, punishments, what kind of consequences are involved besides just that... I, I have, sorry, I need to go back a little mm -hmm. bit. I just learned that Senator Shimabukura and Representative Ichiyama are introducing legislation that will make mandated reporters have it be a felony if they don't report. If they know that there's some abuse going on and they don't report it, then it's a felony. Right now, I think it's a misdemeanor, right? And they're trying to make it a felony. You're, you're in jail, $1,000 fine, I think, is the maximum... Is that what it is? Now. Yeah. Yes. So but, that's just for the non-reporters, right? But it's also, you can lose your license. There's also professional censures beyond the right. legal thing. So something you've worked for half your life it's gone is in gone. a second if yes. you blow it, right? Absolutely. Once, once due process has been followed. Yeah. Well, you know, counselors are on the front line of all this stuff, too. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's so important that, that even they re-examine what the ethics um, 
Mm -hmm. limitations and what the ethics are for their behavior Absolutely. so that they can lead the way when all these other fields and we know okay it's already entertainment we know it's mm. in the polit you know political arena um, now we've got doctors and I think it's going to really spread actually since the very beginning of the Me Too movement I've been saying you watch it's going to be the medical field next and then you know and it's going to be throughout every our field I think it's going to be exactly throughout society as as a whole mm -hmm. and so we need to make these kind of changes I know that I've been watching the news and the the girls that came forward against um, dr. Nasser the gymnast mm. and now it's taking another step forward and they're going after some of the Olympic Committee there's a, a number of them that have already resigned and they're calling for the resignation of others because these girls are coming out saying we told yep. And these people are mandated reporters. And you hear this over and over again. Yeah, you hear this we told, again. but nobody did anything. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. told, nobody did anything. Because society, unfortunately, has this whole shame the victim role going on, because it's easier to shame the victim. Mm -hmm. So the victim doesn't want to say anything because they feel the shame, but I think this Me Too movement has really sort of taken shame out of the picture. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna have more and more and more victims coming forward. And the minute they come forward, they become survivors instead of victims anymore, Absolutely. Right? I sure hope that that's what the outcome of this society-wide change that we're going through right now. I is. absolutely agree. I've had uh, interns who had positions uh, working for the courts in the domestic violence programs where their job was to provide supportive counseling on a temporary basis to keep people engaged in the court process. Someone, I, someone decided to press charges, but... Uh, I, I don't know the exact figures, but there's a high level of, the, they press charges at first, but then as the process goes on, as right. the trial goes on, uh, there's a, a certain percentage that drops out and everything gets uh, right. left alone and not dealt with. Just so, recently, one of my guests, um, Catherine I. Cow, was on, and mm -hmm. she was talking about that same exact thing with the legal system and what happens with it. Mm -hmm. In my own experience with domestic violence and trying to go through the legal system, and mm -hmm. this is way back in the 80s when mm -hmm. it was not popular at all to try to come forward. There weren't really any resources, right. especially in the legal field. Mm -hmm. Once you get into the court system, it's almost as if they do everything they can to dissuade you from going forward with it. I cannot disagree with that, absolutely. <laughs> Leave it to this day in some respects. I think it's gotten yeah. a little bit better, but I think that there are still plenty of things to stand in the way and to just, uh, maybe not stand in the way, but where the easier path of less resistance, not right. the most healthy path, right. is to just drop it and get out of there. Right, you exactly, know? which mm -hmm. is a scary thought. Mm -hmm. I know that Catherine was talking about the fact that um, you know they would just keep postponing it and postponing it and mm -hmm. postponing it. Mm -hmm. So by the time she had a witness to some of her abuse and by the time it actually came to the point where it was going to go to trial and it wasn't being postponed anymore, mm -hmm. she the witness was done coming to People court. People may have moved, all kinds and, of things. Yeah, happen. when that mm -hmm. kind of time goes by and, and that is what led to the tragedy of losing her son mm -hmm. in the process. Mm -hmm. Had the courts been a little bit more on top of things, and instead of sort of preferring the, the abuser, protecting mm -hmm. the abuser's rights mm -hmm. without really protecting the victim's rights. Right. And that's what makes it so that things keep going and going and going until you know, tragedy. Strikes. Well, so this is what we're trying to teach our counselors to recognize when this is happening, right. to intervene very early on. Right. You know, as far as ma as far as increasing the penalties for not reporting, uh, right now it's a it's a uh, uh, an ethical uh, issue for counselors as well. It's not just a legal issue. Um, like I said, uh, you were asking. I mean, you were asking about how people get censured. Well, I mean, they have the legal censures. They have the professional censures. Uh, in California, they have a magazine. When you're licensed, you get a, a monthly magazine that comes in, a marriage and family therapy magazine or something like that. Right, right. And right in the middle, 
it's the first thing that everybody goes to. Right in the middle is five or six pages of MFTs around the state of California who have gotten censured, who have gotten in trouble. Oh my. There's your name. There's what you did. There's the decision of the board. Oh, good. They put it out there in the so world. Like, well, I like well, that. Who's in here? Who's in here? You know? <laughs> who made it this month? Well, right. Talk about shaming. You know? I mean, and, and rightly right. so. Uh, you know, it's uh, by the time they get to that point, it's been due process and it's been proven, and they're. Um, Right. You know, it's something that comes with the territory, I guess. Right. I know when I was dealing with um, my own abuse mm -hmm. and and the stuff that my kids had gone through, I went out and interviewed counselors because I recognized that they have so much power, mm -hmm. and I didn't want anybody, when I was in that vulnerable state, to be giving me bad advice, you know, and yeah. um, or taking advantage. Of and that I problem. had this is the thing that surprised me, so, or exactly taking advantage. Um, what surprised me was all these, the attitude I would get from the counselors. What do you mean you're interviewing me? Well, oh, like a defensive attitude? Yeah. It's like, I'll get back to you on this, right? And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, well, I, I'm gonna, I've got three more people I'm going to talk to. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm See, like, there's a process that we, that we teach in counseling. And it's something that's not okay. new. Wait, let's, let's, let's talk about that when we come back, okay? okay that's I'm right. sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt that's you. That's all right. Um, but um, we need to come back in just a minute. We're going to take a break. If you would please stay with us, because we've got all kinds of really important things to finish discussing. So come back, okay? See you in a minute. Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough, where we motivate, educate, empower, and inspire all women. We are live here every other Thursday at 4 p.m., and we welcome you to join us here at Sister Power. Aloha and thank you. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. Law Across the Sea comes on every other Monday at 11 a.m. Please join us. I like to bring in guests that talk about all types of things that come across the sea to Hawaii. Not just law, love, people, ideas, history. Please join us for Law Across the Sea. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos, and I am Cynthia B. Sinclair, and I am here with Hal Stidger, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist. We're talking about ethics in the counseling field and how important it is, especially right now, with all of the changing things that are happening in all the fields, especially counseling being on the front lines of all of that. But I know you've done a bunch of other stuff. You were saying something right before the break, and I stopped you. So I let me just, I'll make it very quickly. But, but I want, I want uh, you were talking about point. how you were out interviewing counselors, right, right. and you were running into some defensive, like they were, oh my goodness, why are you yes. talking to me? Questions? Okay, so, and this is not new. This has been something that's been in the field for years. But one of the most important concepts that we teach our ethics students, our counseling students, is the idea of informed consent, which is, so that's informed consent, and it's a client right. Okay. So not only is it not the right response to say, what are you asking me these questions for? Actually, it is a counselor's responsibility, and a counselor, psychologist, uh, all the way up through the whole right. field, to give access to their client to ask questions, to know all about the counseling process, to know what their rights are as far as confidentiality, right. to know when, when the relationship needs to be... Uh, when confidentiality needs to be uh, suspended because of a reporting issue or something like that, right. before they open their mouths to say anything beyond hello, it's a counselor's responsibility to make sure they understand those rights because if they don't, then if they haven't done that, then a client can say something that you might have to respond to by making a report and not be aware that that was gonna be a result of what they said. Right, so right. a client has the right to be absolutely informed about all sure. of the parts of the counseling. Well, and here I was, you know, asking them about their experience and asking about, you know, where they went to, to school and all these things, and I got this attitude from mm -hmm. them that just really surprised mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. A good counselor is very proud to talk about those things, and we'll... You would think yeah. so, the good ones, and I, I did find a good one, so I was lucky. If we had an hour, we could just talk all about it. <laughs> <laughs> if we had an hour, but we don't, because I want to get to, um, okay. I want to get to some of the work <clears throat> that you're doing with kids, because mm -hmm. I am a firm believer that instead of trying to retrain adults, let's teach them when they're Young, mm -hmm. so that we Absolutely. can really make some sustainable change <coughs> <Excuse me. clears throat> in regards to um, 
how people think about healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, and not just you know, when I say finding respect in the chaos. Sometimes we have chaos in our own lives, and we have to find the respect for ourselves, mm -hmm. and then respect for other people, mm -hmm. and then respect for the world. So, if we can just find that respect first, then then maybe we can start to establish it and all. And That's I'm wonderfully said. <laughs> thanks. I'm a I'm a firm believer. Mm -hmm. um, in especially with kids. So tell us about the Voyager School. Okay. Which you are a counselor at the Voyager School. I, I've also, been there right? for about uh, twelve years, and I'm a non. So Voyager Public Charter School is a charter school. One of the differences between charter school and a regular. I mean, we're still a Department of Education school, but a charter school is allowed to plan their own curriculum, hire, and, and kind of approach things the way that they want to, as long as they achieve the same or better results as regular ed schools, right? So, right. so this school has hired me, based on my experience, my resume, working with kids my whole career and teenagers, to be a uh, school counselor uh, within their facility but not a Department of Education school counselor. So oh, my job focuses mostly on early identification of uh, uh, you know, all kinds of different uh, uh, social issues and some mental health uh, diagnosis, a, a lot of uh, attention deficit type of stuff and those kind of... Uh, that ADD stuff is so, to me, in my mind anyway, a little bit over... Um, I don't know, overblown, and no. it's like the, the stamp, oh, we'll just call them ADDs, and it seems like that happens so often with kids now, and and it, I get worried, and I know that there's been, a, I raised three boys so uh -huh. that uh -huh. are all in their 30s now, uh -huh. so I know what kind of stuff they go through, and I also know that there's a lot of abuse of the ADD and ADHD drugs that's happening with kids right now. Is yeah, that I, something I, you found? I think that is something that is less prevalent now than it was, let's say, five or ten years ago. Oh, I think that okay. people, because I mean, there isn't a parent that's not aware of that issue right. these days. It's been so publicly talked about and stuff, so they're very much, do I want to say on guard? Yeah, on guard about uh, why are you uh, recommending a med and I actually don't recommend medication until it's a very last resort. Of oh, good! I'm kid. so glad. Um, to hear I think, that. and I really think that that's the stance for most counselors. Now, as you get into psychiatry and stuff like that, if you're, you know, if you go to a psychiatrist, there's uh, a better chance that you will end up with some sort of medication or something like that because that's what they do. Right. Uh, you want to talk? You want me to talk about a little bit what I do? As far as, yes, okay. I'm sorry. So, 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 I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. No, no, no. I, so, uh, <laughs> any counselor that works in a school is going to be doing a lot of psychoeducation in the classes, right? So, we start off right from kindergarten, and then first grade and second grade, I do all three of those years, I do a, a, a puppet show and singing body boundaries <laughs> presentation. Okay? Oh, how cool is it's that? Ca it's called It's Up to Me. And the yes. song, the song lyrics, uh, that I wrote for it to go, uh, it's up to me, it's up to me, me and my body, it's up to me. Nice. Okay? Sing so, it for us, come on. Every Please. day when you're walking along, there's a new, tune, a new tune to whistle that you'll hear in this song. It's a song about loving the body that you own. So here is the message to learn from this song. And it goes, boom, 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 boom. It's up to me. Dun, dun, dun. And they all sing along. It's up to me. I get, Come on, everybody. Me. me and my body. It's up oh, to me. And so, cute. so what That's we're doing. awesome. I like that. That was great. Thank you. What, what we're doing. Oh, I'll always sing. It's a job of a hat. Um, <laughs> but what we're doing is we're trying to get very early on, and we repeat it to them three years in a row, the same exact thing, right. with the same experiences. And it's, it's about an hour-long presentation usually. But um, just teaching, you talked about respect, right? Teaching respect for themselves, teaching respect for the boundaries that others need, and learning, right. uh, teaching them to uh, to begin the process of learning how to really be successful with that and to be nice. um, caring of each other in that right. way. So I do that. Now wait, you also worked for uh, Merrimed, is that what it's called? Merrimed Foundation? That's what I, I want to hear about that okay, one too, what, if you would. What I first, um, what, let me really quickly, let me just finish up about... Uh, oh yeah, Voyager, okay, absolutely, more. Yeah, more. So okay. the, the other thing that we do with the model is each class has a group of kids that have been identified for one reason or another needing, either it's just a social support group where they get together and just kind of take care of each other or there's some issue that's being worked on. So I see a group from each class each week and then out of that group I will see individual kids so that way every classroom is getting coverage oh, cool. every week. Okay. Thanks. Now, about 
Merrimed, which was my first job when I came over from California after uh, uh, completing my education over there. Uh, Merrimed back then, and I don't, I certainly, I don't work for them anymore, but I worked for them for three wonderful years. And Merrimed back then was uh, a ship-based. That's a picture of the ship right there, a ship too, isn't it? based residential yeah. treatment center, yes. Oh my gosh, they go out on the boat? Absolutely. Uh, oh my now, gosh, the program cool. has grown a lot since then, so now there's a series of group homes and there's a, a lot of other things connected to it. But back when I was the program director, uh, it was just the ship. So nice. we, we uh, uh, hired a staff of counselors and uh, nurses and psychologists, and the boat itself, the ship itself, came with a sail crew from the East Coast, all these bearded, gruff sailor types, right? <laughs> and, but they were also used to being teachers because it was a sailing school vessel. So we took 20 boys. Uh, the logistics of having girls and boys on the boat wasn't going to work out, so it was oh, boys. Oh, right, yeah, I can yeah. see how it's close quarters. I can it see how that made things work. complex, yeah? Yeah, uh, more complex. No, no, no. <laughs> so we took 20 boys uh, out of... Uh, Back then, the very crowded Kotlau Youth Facility, uh, they have really emptied that right. facility out since then. But back then, there was 150 kids in there, right? Wow. I think there's like 15 in there now. Don't quote me on that, but it's really, they've really gone away oh, from that idea. Awesome. Um, so, uh, the, uh, so we, took these, we took 20 boys that had been identified from the staff at Kotlau uh, as having some you know, quality, give them a chance, give them a chance. You know, a lot right. of these kids were, were put in trying, there. They were trying, yeah. A lot of those kids were in there for till they were uh, majority, till they were 18 oh, years old. Wow, right. okay? So we, we took them, we put them on the ship, and the program basically was sailing inner island every week, uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we'd go on and say, we'd, go, we'd do stuff like go to Maui for ice cream or something oh like that. Oh my gosh, Just, what a great program. And it's kind of changed these kids' lives in such a big way just to sort of get them out of that that sort of centralized, like you were saying, thinking absolutely. and putting them out there in the world so they just have, you know, and then getting into nature, the outward bound and all that. Did you call it experiential education? There's a right? whole way of doing treatment with ah, children and with people in general called experiential education or experiential treatment. And basically, what it boils down to is you take part in some activity that's a metaphor for life. It's a metaphor for uh, struggle and overcoming and and you know getting things done and you know right. being successful eventually, right? So sailing a big ship is a very challenging thing. There wasn't anything automatic Absolutely. on the ship. Absolutely. And the, the kids and the staff and the crew would all work together. We would all pull lines together. We'd all sing right. sea shanties together as we're doing this. <laughs> and and so, you'd, yeah, these kids were all street kids, gang kids, and stuff like that. And so they would be in an environment that they were completely unfamiliar with, and then they would master it. Over wow. the time they were with us, they would begin the process of learning everything about, about that ship. And by the time they were done, they would have had this experience of, I can do this. I oh, took something wow. that I was never able to do or didn't know anything about and have become successful and I'm actually good at it now. And, and that's they, just life-changing stuff is the is. thing that changes people's lives. Yep. Well, I, this time has gone by so fast I can't believe it. I have so many other questions and so many other things I'd love to be able to talk to you about. It's but unfortunately we are out of time here. So how did you? I am so happy to have had you here. Thank you so much for coming. And pleasure, everybody Mr. out there, I'm just really glad that you joined us today. I hope you will come back every other Friday at 3 o'clock. Will, I will be here, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, on Finding Respect in the Chaos. This is Think Tech Hawaii. Come back and join us again.